Hello. Hello, Facebook land. Hello, internet. Oh, hello, humans on the internet. <laughs> um, happy to be here this Monday for tea time with a big, beautiful group. Oh, here comes another one of uh, our favorite publisher reps in the land. Um, this is great. Look at everybody. Um, Full house. Yeah, here comes Gabe. Very here excited. Is Gabe. Yes. And so we should get right to it. So, whoops, hold on. I've got, I've got that echo going on. Okay. So it looks like it will be Tom, Amanda, Andrea, Patricia, and Gabe. Sure. Kim did promise to be here last week. I know there are a lot of Kim fan people out there. Um, we'll see what happens there. She sometimes slinks in like a cat. Yeah, maybe we'll have still have, there's still time for Kim. Yep. We should get cracking. Yep, so Tom, go for it. Okay, so my first book is a trade paperback original. Um, a Novel Obsession by Caitlin Barish. Um, came out, I think, a week or two ago, I think. Um, so it's a, it's a story of obsession. Um, it's a 20, she's a, the main character is a, is, is the echo me or, does, yes. I just muted everyone, sorry. Um, so I think it might be okay. Okay, I'll try. Does that sound better? Okay. Uh, so um, Naomi Ackerman is a, 24 year old bookseller. So the main character is a bookseller. Um, but this is a bookseller who, um, is, 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 it, it seems she's in a hap she's happily with her boyfriend, a uh, perfectly nice guy, uh, but she develops a, an obsession with her boyfriend's ex and very unhealthy obsession that takes her, um, it's more than just curiosity. At first it's it's like uh, Instagram stalking until finally it sort of comes, becomes real stalking. So it's a novel of, uh, like I said, obsession. It's a book about books because it's because both women who love the same guy are both writers. One of them, the main character is a would, would be writer. She's really looking for material. So it's about uh, the making of books. It's so it, it's a literary novel and also a psychological thriller at the same time. It's I became obsessed with it. Um, couldn't stop reading. Um, first novel, a debut novel. It's a Good Morning America book buzz pick for, I think, last week. Um, so it's very much of the moment because so much of it takes place in um, the, the land of social media. Um, it's really a fun roller coaster ride, basically. Uh, and great to have it uh, in trade paperback from, from the start. So a novel obsession. I think you'll, be, you'll continue to hear a lot more about this novel. Were, were you being punny when you said you became obsessed with it? <laughs> In, I didn't intend to, but yes, I guess. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Inadvertently punny. <laughs> that sounds great. I, really I'm fun. a huge fan of books about books and writing. I mean, they can go terribly wrong, but it sounds yes. like that one is well done. So Yeah, no, it's really good. Cool. Thank you. Amanda. Oh, I can't share my screen. Oh, no. Okay. Yes, now you can. Alrighty, so uh, the first book that I have here uh, today actually came out last week. Um, I had so many books last week that I couldn't pare them down, so we're getting uh, one this week. Um, so we have from Harlan Coben, The Match. Uh, super excited. This is just another uh, book in his uh, Wild uh, from his from his main character Wild. Um, this book uh, is going to follow. He uh, Wild suddenly gets a DNA match online from you know one of those like Ancestry or Twenty Three and Me. Um, and it actually is going to bring him closer to his father, who he's trying to find. Uh, but the man that he meets that has the close genetic match actually just gives him, um, has more or questions than answers. Uh, so off on the adventure, um, he goes. Um, so it's just, you know, again, a fun action thriller keeps you on the edge of your feet uh, the entire time. Um, a fun thing on this one too is the books um, are signed, uh, so you guys do have signed stock of this one in the store. Um, and again, another I'm a huge fan of Harlan Coben, so must read. And uh, we are, along with some other amazing bookstores, uh, co-hosting an event with Harlan Coben 
in conversation with Kristen Hanna. Um, that's on, it had to get, it got slightly rescheduled. So we apologize if anyone out there was um, not happy about that, I understand. But uh, it's on April 8th. So if you know you want a copy of the book, um, we do have a limited amount of signed copies and order the book and you have access to the event. It should be really good. They're, they're both pretty awesome. So I'll put the link for that in the comments. And now it is Andrea's turn. Um, okay, I'm. Can you help me with screen sharing? Can you enable? Okay, great. Um, so the first book I want to talk about today yeah. is Don. Yeah, exciting. Um, Donna Leone's "Give Unto Others." This is her thirty-first installment. <coughs> yeah. Um, of her Venetian mystery series. And um, once again, the star of the show is Commissario Guido Brunetti. And um, this time he's forced to confront the price of loyalty. And, um, and it revolves around his work and his past. So there's some, um, gonna be some very uh, interesting issues here about, you know, digging up, uh, <laughs> digging through his past, which I think, um, any any fan of Don Leo's work will you know love to learn a little bit more about Guido, and um, and it all starts out um, from a seemingly innocent request um, that leads into troubling waters, as my notes say here. This is a twenty seven dollar hardcover from Atlantic Monthly Press, the sister press to Grove. And um, it is out today. There is signed stock in Warwick's. So call and reserve one or rush on down there. Um, I think these will sell out for sure. There's a lot of fans um, um, amongst the uh, loyal cadre of uh, customers there, but also um, a lot of rep fans. I know that Gabe is a huge fan of this series. And, it's book one. Uh, Yep. I mean, you're really like you were there from the beginning. So it's pretty great. Um, so give this one a look, folks. Give unto others. Donna Leon. Yeah, a lot of very dedicated Donna Leon fans at Warwick. So I can't imagine the signed ones will last very long. <laughs> um, they won't. <laughs> yeah. She's one of those that I read that I know I'm, I'm going to get a I was I'm going to get a really satisfactory read. Louise Penny, Martin Walker, uh, Andrea Camilleri, and uh, and Donna Leon. I, yeah. That's when I really need some comfort food. That's where I go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's she's a master. So, all right, Patricia is up, and I'm going to unmute you or ask you to unmute. Sorry. That was my fault. <laughs> Hello. We have a brand new book just shipping today, a book that is kind of a surprise. It's wonderful to see truly new art. Uh, this book is called Kehinda Wiley at the National Gallery, The Prelude. When I sold this book, I had no idea what it would be because uh, Wiley was going to collaborate as a visiting artist at the National Gallery in London and uh, work, do produce new work that was in uh, concert with great works at the gallery. So really, we didn't know what would be there. And I'm very excited with the book. You know Kehinda Wiley for his great portrait of Obama, which I think was recently visiting uh, Los Angeles. But these new works uh, uh, work off of Caspar David Friedrich, uh, Winslow Homer, Jericho, this is a close-up of part of the painting coming from Winslow Homer. Of course, we know from many a book jacket, the solitary soul on Caspar David Friedrich's mountain gazing out. And yet here we have an entirely revelatory new version, new idea, more from that painting. The uh, installation at uh, uh, the National Gallery of London also includes a six-part video installation. The models for the paintings 
and the actors for the video installation are Black Londoners whom Kahinda Wiley met uh, while staying in London and took in some cases to Norway to complete this extraordinary prelude, the name of the video work. Uh, the book is beautiful and uh, just, we find his work so exciting that uh, having, having this arrive on the scene just really took my breath away this weekend. I now, um, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Andrea. Okay, well, I saw him too. I saw um, a show at the Brooklyn Museum um, that blew my mind uh, just because of the scope of his paintings. And the scale. And, yeah, and um, I just think he's one of the most amazing contemporary artists that we have working right now. And um, that's a very exciting book. And I'm glad that... Um, you know, obviously the packaging and the reproductions uh, have like impressed you. So I, I can't wait to take a look at that one. Yeah, it was just, uh, it, it's a book that we announced, I don't know, 10 months ago. So when it finally arrived, it just was such a lovely surprise. I was going to say that I saw his, blue, his, his um, response or response to Blue Boy, which was at the Huntington through December. And now I think both are in London, probably for this exhibit. Is that right, maybe? Possibly. I think yeah. one of the great paintings from, uh, which is Ship of Fools, uh, working with Hieronymus Bosch, which is at the Yale Art Museum, is in London. And I saw his great Napoleonic painting in Detroit, uh, uh, the end of last year. And again, came around a corner and was just stunned. Yeah, I mean, in the Huntington, it just is is so it stands obviously it stands out so it's remarkable, <laughs> and uh, it's inc it's an incredible thing to see that juxtaposition of art. So I love that. Thank you, Patricia. Gabe. Oh, I need to share my screen, and I'm going to talk about the cartographers. Uh, sorry, I'm a small view. Uh, I want to talk about The Cartographers, a really imaginative novel uh, from Peng Shepard. Peng Shepard's previous novel uh, was The Book of M, which was a, a very fantastic uh, novel set in a really dangerous world. Um, this is along the same lines, but a little different. It is set in a very real world, um, contemporary, and a young woman now uh, has uh, distanced herself from her father uh, because they had an argument over some gas station map once upon a time. Her father was a cartographer uh, and they got into it over this gas station map that uh, upon her father's death, she finds maybe more than just this gas station map as she's looking around and realizes this map is quite valuable and it may have something to do with her past. Um, so it's one of those really action-packed novels, uh, but it is uh, slightly fantastic as well. You'll think, I think the reader for this is like a Joe Hill reader, a V.E. Schwab reader. Um, I think people who like, like the Night Circus uh, will like the world that Peng Shepard creates. She creates a really interesting, uh, sense of place uh, and, and they're very laden with atmosphere. So she, you, you sort of, you do go into this world that she creates for you. Uh, and I, she, she, it's a good ride. Book of M uh, got really good reviews. It was a tougher sell because it's the kind of a book it is. It's not such a you know, simple, straightforward narrative. Um, <laughs> this has a lot of the same elements, uh, but it is a little more mainstream in its narrative. So I think it could have a broader readership, but um, I, I think anybody who's looking for a you know, rip roaring adventure novel, um, you know, think about those movies like National Treasure, stuff like that. I think that audience will go for this book. I think there's a lot of, a lot of readers will come, to, will come to the cartographers. So we're really excited to have Peng uh, at Harper, uh, just to have a really cool, creative, different kind of a novel. Cool. Yeah, I see that it's being compared to, well, suggested for readers who like um, Aaron Morgenstern, as you said, and Natasha Pulley, um, who is not 
as well known, but I love her books. Um, and I see that Brad Thor. Yeah, yeah Brad Thor as well, which is interesting. Pretty, pretty mainstream. Yeah, but he. Uh, I mean, be prepared to sw be swept away on an incredible journey. Like that sounds great. Yeah, so, it takes you away. Yeah, definitely does. All right, back to Tom. Kim's on. It looks like Kim's almost almost here. Oh my goodness! Should I go ahead or should we? Sure. Okay. Let's uh let's okay. see if she appears. Okay. So my next book is True Crime, Hell's Half Acre, uh, by a British. Interestingly, it's a very American story, but it's uh, a British historian, Susan Jonas's her first book. Um, so this is about the Bloody Bender. So they are uh, in true crime, serial killer uh, lore. They are an American origin story, really. It's a family of four in Kansas in the 1870s who, um, as I said, known as the Bloody Benders, really gruesome serial killers um, that, and, and their crimes gripped the nation, really have gripped the nation ever since. Um, they disappeared. Uh, no one really knows what happened to them. Um, so it's kind of fun in a way to have a historian who is gonna, she really does a ton of research and has her own theories as to what happened to these four. Um, but it's a great tale of uh, the frontier and it shows you the dark side of the frontier. We're used to the stories of uh, more Laura Ingalls Wilder. Um, this is not that, although there is a very, um, a uh, tiny uh, connection to Laura Ingalls Wilder. The story was so the story was so popular that at one point Laura, Laura Ingalls Wilder, in a speech she gave, kind of tried to connect her family to what happened to the uh, Benders. Uh, the author debunks that whole story, but that just shows you how deeply it was in the American psyche for so long. Um, and in fact, we have so we have this book now in hardcover. We're gonna have a, no a novel based on the Bloody Benders out next, I think in the fall, we just heard about. Um, so anyway, a lot of interest in, in true crime, of course, is, you know, there's so much interest in that right now. The Wall Street Journal Review uh, called it rich in historical perspective and graced by novelistic touches. It grips the reader from first to last. So if you like this sort of thing, you'll really enjoy this book. I'd never heard of them before, but Apparently they yep. were they were really well known in their day. Ooh. Yeah, it's quite good, quite quite horrible. But if you like this sort of thing. I, I'm I'm a scaredy cat, but I know tons <laughs> of people who would be totally into that. So. <laughs> Sounds great. I love to think of it as the flip side of Laura Ingalls Wilder. Ha. <laughs> yeah, I'm more the little house crowd. <laughs> Hi Kim. Yay. Hi. Yay, welcome. Thank you. Are you ready Thanks. to go? Want, yeah. want to do one? I can do one. Please, um, I, I'm so not prepared. I'm so sorry, but these books are so good and I keep missing tea time and I, 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 I don't care anymore. Just read the book. Don't, don't listen to me. Okay, because <laughs> they're so good. My first book is a debut that came out earlier this month and I'm incredibly excited about it. It's Groundskeeping by Lee Cole. Um, it's actually another one of these read with Jenna today's show picks. Um, and it's so good. I was totally blown away. It takes place in 2016, right after the election at sort of peak American cultural political division. And the main character is 28 year old Owen Callahan, who grew up in rural Kentucky and recently emerged from a period of drug abuse, unemployment, and homelessness after graduating from college. Cole is currently living in his grandfather's basement in Louisville, and he's working as a groundskeeper at a local college um, because he has a passion for writing, and he can take one class there for free every semester uh, in its renowned writing workshop. There, he meets and falls in love with Alma, a Princeton grad whose educated and affluent parents are Bosnian immigrants uh, who were refugees from the 1990s Civil War. As their different backgrounds cause conflicts, 
Um, and the novel explores our country's conflicts, its class and cultural divisions. Um, it explores it with remarkable nuance and, and empathy. Uh, the characters are depicted with uh, subtlety and generosity, um, and they're refreshingly free of caricatures and stereotypes. I didn't realize like how much I kept reading that until I read a book without that. Um, <laughs> and his grandfather is, um, is actually my favorite character by far. And this powerful, textured, and tender novel is just fantastic. And it's exactly what our country needs right now. And uh, yeah, this is a writer to watch. He himself is from rural Kentucky and he actually went to the Iowa Writers Conference and, and he kind of pokes fun at, you know, this prestigious, you know, place and just really neat. That is on my list of books to read or listen, I want to, I'm going to, I think I'll listen to it. I've it's actually, I wasn't going to read this book, but I was, I was looking at my, my downloads on Libro, like desperately looking for something to read that wasn't terrible. And I pressed on this one just because it was there. And after like five minutes, I was like, I got to read this. I mean, it, it, it was the, 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 I highly recommend it as a, as an audio book. It's really Great. well done. Excellent. Yeah. You love all the characters. Um, I mean, not love, but you know, it, it's great. Wait, are you saying you listened to the first five minutes and then had to read it on yes. paper? Yeah, yeah, oh, interesting. It faster, you know, I was like in a hurry. Oh. You know what I mean? But but the it's it's narrated really well. Um, the it, it, the the narrator just nails it. It's the I main mean, character of the book, you know, is the you know, and and he just he's he's great. Julie has mentioned this, that she does this, and a lot of people online talk about this. Do you ever speed up your audiobooks? No, um, I hate that. I, every I time. Know. You do? I do. Yeah? Yeah. I, I yeah, just heard it's about too this. Slow. It's too slow. I, huh. I don't, because I, I, you know, they're actors, sort of, and they, I, I personally want to hear their, their, nuanced version of the story but i know tons of people i know people who listen to it on like hyper warp speed <laughs> and my brain is too old and slow to do that but um but uh, yeah a lot of people do that you get i mean you get the story faster for sure and i've tried it but it's just not my personal thing i tried it for the first time this morning yeah and i got kind of got used i was surprised i got used to it yeah, That's it's great. It's great for nonfiction. Yeah, I just I can't do it because everybody sounds like they just sucked on some helium and I can't take them seriously. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it does yeah. take some getting used to, but at, at some point it almost becomes normal in in regards. And some of these audio books, I, I didn't find this out for a really long time. I found this out during a book. I will not name the book that I hated. It was 15 hours long and I had committed so much time to it that I was like, I can't back out now. And then one of my coworkers was like, you can listen to it faster. And I was like, what? And it saved That's me some so time. Funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you, you, yeah, at first it was weird, but then you get used to it. But I will say I can only do it on certain books. Yeah. Like just yeah. like a throwaway fiction, like a, you know, like a rom-com, like a happy like that. Like if it's something that's of, of substance, I, I listened to one incredible one on like, it was like 24 hours a day in ancient Rome. I listened to that one on regular speed because that one had so much going on. So I will say that though, specific ones that are like, but you know, like a nice little rom-com totally yeah. will do it. And I do uh, it 1.5 yeah. is, is like, that's perfect for me, 1.5 speed. Yeah, I'll have to try it again. The 1.5 I found, I found like doable. And that's, um, that's it. Anything more than yeah. that. And you're right. It does sound like chipmunks, whoever said that. I <laughs> went to 1.25, but I didn't go to 1.5. I don't know. But I guess yeah. I get used to it. Yeah. You, you, Deep it, 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 and then it, yeah. it feels like a normal pace after a while you get used to it. I should try this. It, it feels like cheating at book selling. But no, the, great, no. the great Milan Kundera had something to say about this in his wonderful book slowness which i do think needs to be reissued for our time clearly 
if people are going to 1.75 on this. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's excessive. That is excessive. <laughs> oh, I, I used to I, I used to work with someone who who did on 2x, but she was like 20, and I think <laughs> oh, yeah, 20 year olds yeah. have completely different brains. Yeah. Amanda, it's your turn. It is my turn. All right. So here we, oopsie, I almost raised my hand. No, go away. Go away. Go away. Okay. There we go. Okay. I'm still figuring this out. Two years later, right? All right. So here we go. Uh, we, uh, my next book that I have here for us is uh, Wild Wicked Things. Um, and of course, I have lost my notes, which is always spectacular. Bear with me. I apologize. Sorry. I have to do this very quickly. I lost my notes. I thought the thing was too many tabs open. Amanda's at 1.5 speed. All right. I actually speak very fast. Can we speed um, up to tea? Can people speed up tea time? Could we do watch <gasps> us at 1.5 or 1.75? Uh, that'll be fun. You're gonna uh, have to. I do speak very fast. People have to slow me down a lot. So I, I will admit that I, and maybe that's why I do so well with it faster. All right, so here we go. Uh, Wild and Wicked Things. This is a beautiful Gatsby-esque era book uh, set post uh, World War I in England. Um, so in this book, uh, so on Crow Island, people whisper, real magic lurks just below the surface. Uh, neither real magic nor faux magic interest Annie Mason, not after it stole her future. She's only on the island to settle her late father's estate and hopefully reconnect with her long absent best friend Beatrice who fled their dreary lives for a more glamorous one. Yet Crow Island is brimming with temptation and the biggest one may be her new neighbor. Mysterious and alluring Emmeline Delacroix is a figure shadowed by rumors and witchcraft. And when Annie witnesses a confrontation between B and um, Emmeline at one of the island's extravagant parties. She is drawn into a glittering, haunting world, a world where the boundaries of wickedness are tested and the cost of illicit magic might be death. Um, spectacular cover um, on this one. Um, and you can definitely see the Gatsby um, Ness kind of coming through the cover right here. Gorgeous. Um, so fanciful. Love it. I love books that have that kind of, you know, real magic and all of that kind of going on in it. So there we go. Wild and wicked things. That cover is mesmerizing. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Crow Island. I want to go to Crow Island. I'm I'm kind of I, obsessed. I see your crow right there. Obsessed. Yeah, it, that's that's my my stock my my holiday stocking that's just up all the time. Um, and the crow on that cover is correctly rendered. Sometimes you'll see ravens where they're meant to be crows and vice versa. So I'm impressed Ooh. with that cover art on multiple levels. Okay, enough about me. Andrea, it's your turn. Okay. Um, the next book I want to talk about is Jane McGonigal's Imaginable. Awesome. How to see the future coming and feel ready for anything, even things that seem impossible today. This is by um, the best-selling New York Times best-selling author of Reality is Broken, which um, really put her on the map and made her a star in the futurist and gaming communities. Um, and this book, um, I think, will uh, continue to see her star shine in those worlds, but also um, to us, you know, regular lay people. Um, this is, let's see here, um, it's $30 hardcover, and this is from, um, and it's a, it's a big book, and um, both literally and figuratively, I think this is um, a big, Did we, we lose, lose Andrea? Andrea? Oh no. Okay. Well, we can we'll come back. Um oh, I forgot to say that this oh, uh, comes sorry. This there comes you are. Oh, ah! you go. She's gone again. There she's back. Hmm. Frozen. Yeah. I'm gonna stop her video or her, oops, ah. Gotta have technical difficulties. Um, teaches, oops. Uh -oh. 
Sorry, Andrea. Are you still there? Yeah, I think it's probably better that I have my video off. Can you hear me now? I think I'm unstable yep. my connection. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I stopped your screen share. Okay, that's it's fine. People saw the cover. Um, yeah. But anyway, um, what was I saying? Um, so this forecaster, uh, future forecaster and game designer is um, teaching us how to envision, envision the future before it arrives and give us the tools to help shape that world, this future world and um, the way and, and how, I'm sorry, I can't even speak, how we want, how we want the world to look, how the world we want to live in. Um, so she's drawing on the latest scientific research in neuroscience and psychology um, to show us how to train our minds to think the unthinkable and imagine the unimaginable. And uh, McGonagall invites us to play with the provocative thought experiments and future simulations she's design designed exclusively for this book. Um, and with the goals basically to build our collective imagination so that we can dive into the future and envision in pretty surprising detail what our lives will look like 10 years out, uh, develop the courage and vision to solve problems creatively, take actions and make decisions that will help shape that future that we desire and access what she calls urgent optimism, which I, I love that term, um, which is basically an unstoppable force within each of us that activates our sense of agency so that we're not helpless in um, the face of these uh, changes that um, she's predicting here. Um, so basically more than 10 years ago, McGonagall ran simulations that predicted a global pandemic and how it would change human behavior. Um, so I really think that um, she has the pulse on um, what could be just around the corner for us. Um, and I just think this is a big book for this moment um, and will show readers how to think like a futurist and pre prepare for this future that is really just around the corner. All right, so um, once again, that's imaginable, how to see the future coming and feel ready for anything, even things that seem impossible today. $30 from Spiegel and Grau and it's out right now. Yeah, it's a it's a it's an amazing book. It it's both um, it's alarming in the best possible way. <laughs> like it helps you temper. You know, you know, a lot of people think about thinking. A lot of people think about the future in a very anxious way, and she totally addresses that and um, really does a lot to explain how planning for the future and running through multiple scenarios can be a very positive thing. It's pretty cool. Yeah, okay. I mean, I do like the whole agency bit, right? Yes. You know, like it gives you ways to feel like you have agency and that, you know, given like what we've all been through in the last couple of years, that's something definitely, it's like, it's a, you know, a lifeboat in a roiling sea, so. Absolutely. I'm holding on to that phrase, urgent optimism. Uh-huh. That seems I like do it. like it. I like it. I might get a tattoo. I wonder how many people here have tattoos, but that's another, that's a total another live stream or conversation at the bar when we can. Uh, Gabe, it's your turn. Okay, I'm going to talk about snail tail, what? So this is a fun book, Snails and Monkey Tales. A uh, lot of books about uh, language and punctuation guides. And this is a fun book on punctuation. Michael Arendt is a graphic designer who's been fascinated by the shapes and the structure of uh, our punctuation marks. So this is a <laughs> history of the punctuation mark, how it came into be, how it came, how they came to be accepted into our common language. Um, we look at uh, this is an example of the spreads on the inside. Give you an idea, little blurry, but uh, gives you an idea. So it's very colorful, uh, breezy kind of a read um, with a little capsules of history and grammar lessons, and uh, you know. Uh, 
how to use the comma properly, which is probably the most used punctuation mark, um, uh, quotation marks, you know, punctuation outside or inside of the, uh, or quotation marks inside of the punctuation. How about if you're quoting a quote or if you're quoting somebody quoting somebody, where does the punctuation go or what do you use instead? Um, so, you know, for the, um, for the word Nazi, for the language geek, uh, there's fans of uh, this sort of books. I think the Eat, Shoots and Leaves uh, audience will really like this. Uh, and I think the visual aspect, it's a little oversized. Uh, it just makes it, makes language fun. And I, you know, my sister and I were having a conversation the other day about what, where we learned grammar and we learned grammar in college and we had to <laughs> buckle down because they might have taught it. I don't know, but I might have missed that day. But uh, my grammar was atrocious until I got into college and it was like style guides and Turabian and white and, uh, you know, massive studying on punctuation. So uh, fun stuff. That's really neat. I love how it is part. It, it it's typography too. It's not just grammar and syntax and yeah, yeah. That's really neat. Yeah, the graphics look great. Yeah, it's beautiful. From a graphic designer's POV. Neat. Patricia, your turn. No. Yeah. Well, I love thinking about the interrobang and the Oxford comma. And really smart looking book. Uh -huh. I have a book that's shipping now, so we'll be arriving in stores very soon. Uh, this author, Paul Kennedy, I have awarded my uh, seasonal use of the word magisterial. I try to limit that to one book per list. And he certainly has deserved it for Rise and Fall of the Great Powers. <clears throat> He's one of the great historians, but also one of the great uh, World War II and naval historians. And here he's having uh, uh, digging deep into World War II, into the uh, uh, allied navies of Britain, France, and the United States, and the Axis navies of Germany, uh, Italy, and Japan, and all that happened, but with the greater thesis that it was World War II which launched America as a great power. Uh, the book is very handsome. Uh, it is illustrated throughout in an unexpected way for a book of this kind, even in this galley, you get a sense of the quality. Uh, the paintings by Ian Marshall are much heralded. Uh, Marshall recently passed away. They had a close alliance and there's a, a lot of praise for that as well. Uh, the World War II reader, the military reader, the, the, the big history armchair. Uh, you might have seen um, a piece on museum ships in the New York Times this weekend. And certainly one of the great museum ships is in San Diego, the USS Midway. Uh, this is a book for all of that kind of uh, astonished attention that we still bring uh, to the great battles now over 75 years ago. It is astounding how, how much time has passed and yet how we remain transfixed and in some ways remain in that world or the possibility of that world as we've been reminded uh, terribly this last month uh, that uh, stirring up the great, uh, and of course it's naval power that is, is at the crux of the Crimea. So Paul Kennedy's Victory at Sea, big old fashioned book, big old fashioned author and just landing. Thank you. Handsome indeed, that is a good looking book. Thank you, Patricia. Kim. Okay. My next book is The Summers by Julie Atsuka, who wrote The Buddha in the Attic and When the Emperor Was Divine, both of which won multiple awards. Um, and The Summers is a poignant, playful, and beautiful novel about dementia. Uh, the first part describes a group of avid swimmers who use a community pool. They rep represent a wide range of occupations, demographics, reasons to swim, and swimming styles, uh, including Alice, who has dementia. When the pool develops cracks and must be shut down for safety reasons, the swimmers' daily lives are abruptly disrupted. This especially affects Alice. Uh, who lacking this structure in her life is placed in a nursing home by her husband and daughter. Her life there forms the second part of this novel 
And Atsuka adroitly describes its bureaucratic coldness and Alice's increasing confusion and terror there is heart-wrenching. Um, the final section of the book is told lovingly and tenderly um, from her daughter's perspective as she visits her mother, deals with this grief and sadness and happy memories. Um, and it brings us back to some of those past happy memories. And this novel gives rare empathy and dignity to aging and dementia. And it manages this incredible feat of being both funny and, and poignant and, and almost uplifting, certainly not depressing, while dealing with this incredibly hard, hard topic and this, you know, ultimately sad, bittersweet story. And it, it's um, Julia Tsaka herself dealt with this with her own mother and, you know, draws on this heavily in the book. Um, it's really neat. And the, the structure is completely unique. The, it uses different voices in each of the three parts is told from a completely different voice and really unusual, just beautiful book. And, you know, all of us, I think, have you know, dementia in our lives in some way or another, or we will when we get old enough. And um, it's hard. Dementia is really, really hard. Yeah, I know so many people dealing with that. And uh, it's in my family as well. So. Yeah, yeah. This makes you, I don't know, feel a little bit less alone and just, um, you know, like, wow. Yeah. Thank you was starting to tear up listening to you talk about it. Okay, lightning round. We're doing pretty pretty good on time considering how many amazing uh, people and books there are here. So, um, Tom. All right, uh, I have a true light, I have an easy lightning round pick. The Women uh, of Chateau Lafayette, which is new in paperback, which is why I'm bringing it back to people's attention, but I did talk about it last year. It's um, Stephanie Dre who, um, telling the story through the, the this castle in uh, the heart of France uh, three the lives of three women um, there's Adrienne Lafayette in the 1770s who's the wife of the Marquis de Lafayette um, and then just before World War one there's uh, a, a socialite who becomes a very important figure um, in that in that uh, chateau Beatrice Chandler um, and she sets up a, an orphanage, which, which takes us through to World War II, where there's a third woman, Mar Marta Simone. So it's um, three remarkable women. I mean, if you love historical fiction, um, you'll love this book. Um, Kate Quinn, who I know is a Warwick's favorite, um, is a fan of the book. And I think uh, she, on the cover, she calls it a masterpiece. So if you like Kate Quinn and you didn't get it in hardcover, The Women of Chateau Lafayette in paper. Interesting what they did with the cover art. Uh, I know it's very different. Yeah. Instead of the uh, the the back turned to us, which is getting a lot oh, of black, yeah. um, they 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 use the sun to make make the face <laughs> that's indistinguishable. Right. That's, that's pretty clever. Right. Creative <laughs> use of a uh, trope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Yeah. Amanda. All righty. So my last book that I have is a uh, troublemaker. Uh, this is by uh, John Cho. And once again, I lost my notes. Sorry guys, I don't know why I keep losing my notes. Um, so this book actually, so John Cho is the actor John Cho. Um, if you will know him from um, Harold and Kumar. Um, so that is who he is. Um, and this book actually takes place uh, during the 1992 LA riots. Um, and this is actually a perspective um, semi based on uh, John's own experience um, at that time uh, being Korean American. Um, so for this 12 year old Jordan feels like he is failing at everything school his parents expectations just life in general. It doesn't help that his older sister seems to excel at everything. Um, so with racial tension rising in Los Angeles, Jordan watches as the communities explode in response to the acquittal of the police officers who beat Rodney King and the recent shooting of a young black teen, uh, Latasha Harlins, by a Korean store owner. 
the shooting of Latasha hits Jordan hard, making him wonder about his parents, also Korean American immigrants and shop owners who could have been in the same situation. So this book takes place um, over one night um, as uh, Jordan, um, along with his father and a friend, um, go off to see and check on their own uh, store. Um, so again, it is an interesting perspective to the LA riots, um, again, based on John's own experience. Um, so this is a wonderful uh, middle grade novel that we have um, out tomorrow. Thank you. All right, Gabe. Or no, I'm yeah. sorry, Andrea, Andrea, right? Am I tripping? Yeah, yeah that's it's. I'm pretty sure it's me. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to talk about um, it, the new trade paper release of an atlas of extinct extinct countries. Fun. This, yeah, this is great. This is from Europa Compass, their nonfiction line, um, and basically Europa did not publish or did not print enough hardcovers. Um, in the middle of the pandemic when it was before it was clear that supply chain issues were going to clog everything up so instead of reprinting um hardcover and never in hardcover and never getting those books um even though readers were clamoring for it um they decided to move up the uh, paperback release about six months and so it is out today we're happy about that it's 1795 trade paper um, so definitely something to um, take a look at and uh, run on down to Warworks to get. Um, so it's basically um, just a really hilarious and fascinating look at um, nations that have gone extinct through various um, means, but usually um, due to incompetency um, or unreliable profits, that sort of thing. Um, and prophets like um, the soothsayer, not ITS. Um, but you know, of course, there are people. There are countries that did go broke as well. Um, Leslie Rains, City of City of Asylum Bookstore in Pittsburgh, says, "Not just a recitation of nations that no longer exist. An atlas of extinct countries is a very pointed and very funny critique of nation states, borders, and the flawed men who make them. A timely cautionary history." So um, I just, I think this is a fantastic little read um, and it is definitely a cautionary tale and, um, and perhaps more timely than we'd like uh, at this point. But um, this is a little gem of a book and I do hope you go and pick this up. All right, that reminds me a little bit of that. Um, that penguin book, the Atlas of Remote Islands, the 50 islands I've That's never right, visited. Yeah. There yeah. are illustrations in that one, right, Andrea? Yeah, I'm uh, sorry, I forgot to tell you, it's uh, fully yeah. illustrated, which is nice. Yeah. Um, and it's a nice little extra feature. Cool, yeah. thank you. I'm all befuddled, uh, muddled. Um, Patricia or Gabe is next, who? Patricia, I think. Okay. I'm just going to show some new additions to a little series from Princeton. Uh, they got started with a little purple book, which I just rushed off to see if I could grab, but apparently I can't put my hands on it. Fungopedia. That was wildly successful. And since then, we've had Birdpedia, Flowerpedia, and two new ones. The new ones are Geopedia and Insectpedia. The series is very smart, but totally approachable. They're, they're extremely appealing books. They have illustrated end papers, in this case, uh, geological. Uh, we have a wonderful author here, Marsha. There you go. Thank you. Uh, there's that. And open it up and you can see the spore end papers there. There we go, spores. And uh, uh, Marsha Bjorn wrote a book of ours called Timefulness, which was a rich, deep meditation on geologic time and human time and what a longer perspective might bring to you. And she, she's unusually witty and marvelous in Geopedia. Uh, she begins by addressing uh, humans, 
uh, and our first identity as being of this planet, of this earth, even reminding us of the, of the Hebrew in Genesis that Adam means made of hummus, made of earth. Uh, the books are obviously with the PDF format, very Abecedarian. So we have uh, uh, something for every letter of the alphabet, uh, amethyst, uh, brimstone, ergs, those unmarked sands of time. But there were many terms here that I had never heard of. Uh, Nunatak is an Inuktitut Greenlandic term for a rocky peak peeking out of a glacial wasteland. Um, it's full of unexpected facts, words you didn't know that you might be able to win Scrabble with, and uh, very delightful. The second uh, one for this season, Insectpedia. Similarly, we've got the nice B papers. And um, again, wonderful illustrations, smart books. Uh, Princeton can't stop themselves now. They're on a Pedia kick, so we'll have something, something new ahead. They're such handsome little books. They're, they're the perfect gift for anyone who's into um, the, the natural world and books. I know there's a Dinopedia coming too, right? Yeah, we've got yeah. a Dinopedia. Cool, I'm excited. Maybe Thank an you. orthopedia for the old folks. <laughs> Very well done. I'm, I'm hoping for zombiepedia. You know, we all have our list. <laughs> All right, we're in the home stretch, Gabe, and then Kim. I am literally lightning round. I got to blow after I present my books. I'm sorry, Kim, I'm going to have to run, but I wanted to present uh, the Oak Papers and Paperback. Just went on sale. Uh, yes, last week. I had 20 books last week, and I love this. the read on this book. It's a really prof profound meditation on life and the natural world. Um, our author sat and meditated for two years under this majestic 800 year old oak tree um, and just sort of melded with it and uh, was very introspective of the world, became really uh, aware of the world around him and the natural world around him and the future for these trees that we used to coexist and we relied on them for wood and shelters and whatnot and uh, we don't have that relationship anymore. So where are we heading? And uh, so it's a big call out to protect the natural world, look out for the natural world and uh, how cool it is to sit under a tree that's been around since the Magna Carta was signed uh, in 1215. So and that's what I have, just a great, I just think a really, really smart uh, read and very spiritual in its nature. I, I found for the secular spiritualist uh, searcher, I think it's also a really good book for that, uh, that audience as well. Yes, a very good addition to the tree canon. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you, guys. I got a blow. I'm afraid. Sorry okay. to cut yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. Bye. Bye. Kim, bring it on home. Okay. My last book, um, actually, Gabe did last week. Um, it's The yeah. Old Woman with the Knife. I thought that was a Kim book. This book literally <laughs> has my name on it. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> And uh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna paraphrase the the blurb here. Um, it, it's it's a it's a Korean book that's been translated into English, um, and uh, and it was a total sensation in Korea. And um, it's uh, it's totally unique and mordantly funny, and it's a novel about aging and decline, love and compassion, in addition to being a thriller. It features Hornclaw, a 65-year-old female contract killer or assassin. She uses a poison knife, and after a 40-odd year career, she is considering retirement, but things get in her way. And the action-filled plot also manages to describe the mundane annoyances of corporate life, including bureaucracy, um, uh, ageism, you know, her dismissive younger colleagues, and petty disagreements with management. It also incorporates the harsh economic and social realities of modern Korean society, including economic recession, poverty among senior citizens, and the effects of the lingering American military presence. And, and it, it's sort of a, a little bit, you know, squid games and um, a parasite and, uh, 
and we understand reading this book, the desperate circumstances that motivate the characters to turn to contract killing in the first place. And it, it's really fun and it's, uh, it's neat. And there's a doggo. And there's a dog, yeah. She lives alone with her dog, who of course is my favorite character. Yeah, <laughs> important plot point. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Yeah, this is really fun. You know, yeah, I definitely I, thought of you when I saw I, that one I mean, last week. All of us aging, you know, women can relate to this character. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's hard being a contract killer. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, your body gets rickety and it's just <laughs> harder than it used to be. Andrea can talk about that. Oh, no, she can't. She's undercover, as we found out last week. <laughs> That's right. um, we covered that last week. Yeah. Thank you all. This was awesome. Sorry it ran a little long again. Um, it's my fault. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. Everyone showed up to cover my butt because I, I was freaked out about Julie not being here. Julie should be back next week. Yeah. And um, there are so many great books, though. That's, you know, yet another reason to have you all show up. So thank you so much. Um, speaking of long, uh, I'm just going to pose this question really quick that came from Sarita, who is a great viewer of ours. And I think it might be one, if, if, you, if you all want to think about it and come back with answers later, what is the very best long book you have ever read? How long? I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, when I think about a long book, I think maybe 500 pages of it? I think so, yeah. Yeah. That sounds about right. I was thinking like four to 500. Yeah. So if, if you wanted to mull that over maybe and, and answer next next time we see you that'd be cool i think that's a great question yeah. we were we were talking about tags such as magisterial my <laughs> other tag is big fat book and i award this <laughs> only if the book can earn it which is uh, at 700 pages or more which oh yeah <laughs> yeah okay. door doorstop status Okay, um, I have one that comes in at 678, so I hope that qualifies, Patricia. I hope uh, it's, yeah. it's we pretty let close. Them slide, under the, slide under the wire. Okay, <laughs> thank you. That would be Earthly Powers by uh, exactly. Anthony Burgess. Oh, yeah. Is just, it, that's magisterial, for sure. It blew my mind when I read it, so. I've always wanted one. to read it, but I haven't read it. It's really great. Um, I'm not going to do it here, but um, just look up on Wiki. Um, at, look, just put in "Earthly Powers" first sentence, and it will kind of give you um, the like the tone. It will it sets the tone. It's a rollicking tale that basically covers the 20th century with the protagonist's long life. It's one of those great sort of survey of a century. Um, from a well-placed and um, like idiosyncratic character, so. Thank you. Great. Yeah, yeah. We can we can all think about it. I have to think about it for sure. Yeah, I do too. Thank you so much, everybody. And uh, yeah. yeah. Thank so you. Thank you. See Amanda. you soon. See you all soon. Great batch of books. And thank you, everyone, for watching. We'll see you later. And...